This review was filmed during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. Without the labor of the writers and actors currently on strike, the works being covered here wouldn't exist. I fully support the WGA and SAG AFTRA in their fight for fair treatment and compensation against a system that continually denies them such. While a full boycott has not been called for, SAG AFTRA has asked that everyone who does media about film and TV refrain from promoting struck content during this time. From what I can tell based on guidelines they have released, independent reviews do not constitute promotion of a work, but critical assessment of said work of art. Any praise that I give to these works during this video should be seen as praise purely for the artists, writers, and actors who created it. If anything, the praise is emphasizing that the writers, actors, and other artists deserve more compensation because they are who make these works possible. Additionally, this video was not made using any studio-provided screeners or materials. Do not support any studios during the strike. Lower decks. There's a, there's a, it's a wall. It's a wall. Can't go any further than that. Lower decks. I'm okay. Lower decks. Hello, interwebs. I am here to review the latest episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds, this time season two, episode seven, Those Old Scientists. And this episode was secretly dropped because of San Diego Comic-Con. They released it early. I'm actually going to San Diego Comic-Con. I'm not talking about that that much, just considering the SAG after strike and all the stuff that I might be considered an influencer and all that jazz. But that being said, I could not not talk about this episode because if any of you have been following me for any length of time, you know that Star Trek Lower Decks is my favorite ongoing Star Trek and one of my favorite Star Trek is one of my favorite shows of all time and I adore this show so freaking much I adore it and when I heard that they were doing a crossover episode of Strange New Worlds I knew in my heart that it was going to be one of my favorite episodes and I want to be very honest with you sorry I'm speaking so fast uh, that I am not going to be able to be like an objective critic in this episode I'm just so happy and excited and I loved this episode uh, we'll stay spoiler free for a minute then I'll get into spoilers and I'm sorry that it's just going to be an excited rant at you for however long this review goes but I, I adored this episode so much um, like I said I love Lower Deck and Boimler and Mariner and as well as Tendi who's my favorite she's back there uh, and 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 you know Rutherford they're all my favorite characters and I just adore them so much and getting to see Jack Quaid and Tawny Newsom who I have met in real life um, and know that they are such amazing wonderful people I met them in Mission Chicago and they were the sweetest kindest people and getting to see them uh, be these characters in, in real life and getting to play them was just so amazing and joyous and, and they played them so perfectly and, and getting to see these little like nerds who are just as excited about Star Trek as I am be in in Star Trek Trek, it just felt like I was like a fan there with them, but also a fan of them and and it was just it was so wonderful. And yet, what I love this episode the most for is it wasn't just like, oh, uh, like a lower deck. I mean, I love lower decks, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't just like them going like, oh, look at this thing, look at this thing. But there was just such great character moments that fit in, not only with the um, ongoing storylines with our characters that we've seen all season, specifically, I think, even, even Spock and Chapel and uh, a little bit of La'an and even Una. Like, it touched upon all of their arcs throughout the season, and yet also expounded upon a little bit with Boimler and Mariner as well. This episode just managed to, you know, do so much while also being a fun little comedy episode um it, it, it i was actually kind of shocked like it didn't like you know it didn't explode wide open all of their these character arcs but it managed to touch upon all of them and it, it was just so deftly handled and yet also handled lower dexian themes and i and i have to be frank with you I, again we're staying spoiler free here but there is a plot beat in this episode there is a plot beat in this episode that as soon as i it came up and i and i saw that that's where they were going i'm like was this was this episode made for me? Was this episode made for me specifically? Like, cause there was just, there's just one plot piece. I'm like, this is, this is, ev this is everything. This is everything Jesse wants from a Star Trek. The only thing it's missing is if like Jedzia Dax showed up. If Jedzia Dax showed up, I would have just died and been like, stop Star Trek, we're done. I don't need more, this is everything. Um, but beyond that, sorry, spoiler, Jedzia doesn't show up. But beyond that, short of that, they did everything that I wanted this episode to be. And again, I, it's hard for me to be an objective critic and bring a critical lens to this. I'm sure over time I will find more that I can be more objective about, but this is just gonna be a gushing review because I, I love this episode. This this just brought so much joy to my heart. Um, you know, it's been a stressful few weeks for positive and negative reasons. You know, things going on in my life. Uh, again, both good and bad, moving to a new place. And, and to have this episode was just a, a moment of pure 
unadulterated joy, um, and and I loved it. So with that said, let us go into spoilers, because y'all, I'm not, however long this goes is however long it goes, because uh, I, I just have so much to talk about here. I have a whole list of spoilers here, but can I just start off? Holy shit, the part of the plot hinges upon the Annex 01. The Annex 01, like, as soon as I saw that, I was like, I heard a reference of it in the opening, like, animation section, and I was like, oh, is that gonna come back up? That seems like it's thing that's gonna come back up, and it does, and I was like, oh my god, they're referencing Mayweather and Hoshi, and I mwah, love it so much. But anyways, let's get into this episode, because I just, I loved it. We start off the episode in Lower Decks on the Cerritos, and we get to see our crew hanging out uh, there. I love that we started off animated. I also really hope, you know, a small part of me hopes that, like, because this is on Strange New Worlds, that this brings more attention to Lower Decks. I'm sure Strange New Worlds gets bigger ratings than Lower Decks. It's kind of part and parcel with animation. So I hope if you are a Strange New Worlds fan, uh, and you have not seen Lower Decks, go watch it because if you liked this episode, because I, I cannot speak the praise of it enough, but I love that we're starting off the episode here, and we kind of get like a little touch upon all the things that are going to come up. It's like sort of like Chekhov's, um, you know, guns are, are information, you know, setting up like Mariner said it was discovered by Pike, the second Enterprise, not the NX-01 Enterprise, so reference to the NX-01 there, setting up all those things. Again, this is why I love Lower Decks writing a lot, is it's very efficient of just like, you know, setting these things up. People will say like, oh, that's just an oblong reference, but it's actually setting up story beats down the line very intelligently you know uh stuff with like you know mariner gets to be in charge and you know she's like i don't really care i don't like being in charge but then you see later on she's worried about him. anyways um and they want to measure tachyons it was great to see tendy and everything uh, calling talking about U uh, una and spock um and you know those old scientists and so they go down to this planet and there's a guardian of forever style portal and i love the jokes of like you know it's you know it's a portal you know where you just be random portal stuff and you know tendy sort of saying this was discovered by the orions and we you know, this is a kind of recurring motif with Tendi in Lower Decks, with, like, Tendi talking about how, like, not all Ryans are pirates, and she doesn't like to be pigeonholed as a pirate. And I like that this sort of is a thing that will come up throughout the episode about how times have changed in terms of how people have prejudices or think about certain species, and that be a thing going into the past here. Uh, just all these quick little references going on that, again, are setting up character beats down the line. And I love when Boimler gets sucked into the portal because they take the picture. Um, he says, the portal is trying to portal me! <laughs> which is such a which is such a wonderful line and then when he gets sucked in and he gets sent back to the past he yells remember me <laughs> I loved it. Uh, it was just, it was a fun little beat. Uh, and it just a great, like, Guardians of Forever style of portal thing going on here. Uh, then we have Jack Quaid in live action showing up in the back as Boimler. And he's like, oh, you guys look very realistic. I, I love that that works both in-universe and out-of-universe. Out-of-universe, obviously, Jack Quaid's not live action. He's seeing them, they don't look animated. So it's, it's, it's different uh, for us visually. But in-universe, where there's not technically a difference between the animation and the non-animation, um, uh, they're all supposed to be seeing the same thing. He doesn't like buy that they're like the real people that he's dreamt about his whole life from pictures and things like that. Uh, so it was um, it was a cool uh, like double double sort of joke there. Um, then we get the animated opening sequence. I loved this. I was wondering when it popped on if it was going to be animated. I loved seeing the sequence. I love the little tiny changes. Like you get to see the um, the energy sucking thing on the nacelle of the Enterprise in a few of the shots, which is great, and it like falling off at one point. And also the koala, the koala. What does he know? Uh, appears in the uh, in the final shot with the title card. You get to see the koala in the background. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. I thought that was uh, that was fun. Uh, if you have watch Lower Decks, you don't know what the koala is, but, uh, you know, why is he smiling? What does he know? The universe is balanced on the back of a giant koala! Why is he smiling? What does he know? So then we learn uh, from the captain's log that they are delivering grain to a planet, and that's why they were running analysis on um, uh, this portal because they just had some time. And I like this gra uh, the grain reference kind of reminds me of episodes like the the Trouble with Tribbles because that is an also an episode where you know the Enterprise was dealing with grain stuff and delivering it to different colonists in that episode as well. So kind of an oblong reference to to that. Uh, I love that they like they have the communicator like ones uh, they're talking about Boimler's communicator and why it's you know it can communicate and he's like oh but the best part is flipping it open. And uh, I love seeing Boimler in real life. I love that his boots, you can see on his boots in Med Bay when they get there to see him, have the Delta on the bottom just like they do in Lower Decks. And I, I loved seeing that. The, like, the attention to detail was so nice. Uh, and I just love Boimler trying his best to hide that he's in the past. Like, oh, computer and program, he thinks it's initially the holodeck. And he's just like, oh, start date, five digits. That's totally a normal date to have. Uh, and they said, okay, I know you're from the future. And he said, okay, don't affect the timeline. 
Um, and also Boyden was like laughing at like a funny captain because they don't have to deal with his captain who's a bit more of a stick in the mud uh, from Lower Decks. Uh, so loved, loved seeing all of that. Um, and I love Boimler afterwards just freaking out about seeing all the bits and panels of the Enterprise. And Lon's like, don't touch that. Uh, and they review temporal protocols. And this is where I, again, I love this episode for touching on beats with our characters because Lon says, yes, I did just recently time travel um, and no sharing knowledge from the future. And Boimler says, Worf's honor. And I just love that nice little reference to uh, uh, to wharf there uh, in a very Boimler lower Dexian way. But again, touching upon La'an having recent time travel in what, episode three and that having deeply affected her. So she would she would be very careful to be like, hey, you don't want to lose your loved ones doing this. And because she's probably thinking about Kirk uh, in that moment, the alt version of Kirk that died in that episode. So I, I just like that these these beats are remembered between episodes um, I, and, and being brought up here to inform these characters' interactions with Boimler. I thought was all great. Um, then we have uh, Boimler in the ready room freaking out over the captain's saddle and riding it was great and then we start off an arc for uhura in this episode where she's you know she's working too hard she does not to take a break um and uh Boimler kind of freaking out that she's kind of like this aggrandized figure and trying not to let on but very clearly letting it on and i like this like arc uh for for uhura it's like i i would love to unpack that but i'm just trying to find a place secret place to work then they beam down to the planet and Boimler freaking out over spock and mbenga and the tricorder was always fun less likely to explode always got me and then spock like laughing at uh something ridiculous Boimler said and that freaking Boimler out and all those shots of like Boimler seeing Spock's face smiling I was laughing hysterically I'm sure some people are going to freak out some of the canon heads are like Spock would never do this blah, blah, blah. but that's kind of what Boimler is doing too right that's kind of the point that they're making is that Spock you know you don't learn these like little tiny details about Spock in his life from having never existed next to him um, and so Boimler kind of being freaked out about where Spock's in his journey right now and not knowing what's actually happening thinking he broke Spock um, so again I love that this is touching upon Spock and Chapel's arc in a potentially negative way. Then we get uh, an Orion vessel showing up and Boimler rightfully pointing out, it's like not all Orions are pirates and sort of referencing Tendi and, and so that ongoing story. And it uh, turns out that they shouldn't have listened to Boimler. And I love I love all the, the jokes, like the Orion giving very, like very much villain vibes. Uh, it's like, oh, they give the rest of us a bad name. Um, and, you know, Boimler trying to argue that it's a peaceful vessel, uh, but they end up stealing up the portal and, you know, taking it. Uh, so I, I thought that this was, like, kind of an interesting little beat. You know, I, I have to sit and analyze the feelings about how they protect the Orions here, but I, I kind of like where it ends with their characters at the end of this episode. Uh, but overall, I like, like, you know, Boimler's, you know, trying to do the right thing, but ultimately screws up the situation. Uh, I thought it was kind of fun in a very lower Dexian kind of way. And I do like that we get a Pike and Una scene after this where they're like, Boimler's like a toddler, not knocking over furniture, which is a very apt description, uh, I think, of, of Boimler as a character. I feel like that's uh, very good, uh, where Una's like, he's terrified of me. and um, But then we have uh, Boimler in the mess hall, and Ortegas and Chapel just kind of messing with him, like uncontrollable vomiting, all those jokes. Do they have, do we have jetpacks in the future? Well, we have jetpacks now. Well, I mean, smaller jetpacks. Uh, and Boimler talking about with like this reverence of the past, this golden age of exploration, um, and letting on that uh, Pike, it's Pike's birthday soon. And they're thinking about like throwing him a party and stuff and giving him all the credit, so much credit. Um, again, I thought, I thought this was a nice beat of Boimler just trying to like have this moment of like, just taking it in and wanting to ask questions about what is it like to exist in this time um, and and sort of having this reverence for it without realizing that he can also exist in the present and, and in the moment um, is sort of his arc that this episode is, like being in the present with the people with you right now instead of constantly like referencing the past, which is an interesting interesting arc to take the lower deck scene characters on who are always very reference heavy. Uh, I thought is a is a cool arc for his character in this episode. Um, but then we uh, have a moment with Spock and Chapel, uh, where Spock's smiling, again, freaking Boimler out. And so uh, Boimler goes to Chapel and says, did I break Spock? You know, did I butterfly affect him? Did I ruin something? And then realizing, no, that this was actually something that Chapel's influence on him. And I'm curious to see how this, uh, this scene is going to affect future episodes of the show, because it is very clear that Chapel is hurt by the fact that, you know, Spock... Uh, she doesn't seem to have a very lasting effect on Spock in terms of the grand scheme of history. Um, and I think that that's very clearly hurts her for hearing that from Boimler, even though Boimler didn't intend that and it being very awkward. And I liked that scene. And, and I'm ultimately kind of curious to see what it's going to do to for Chapel to realize that she's this footnote. You know, one of the things that I've, I've had mixed feelings on about with this season of the show is Spock and Chapel's relationship, thinking more on it uh, since episode five, and is just like Chapel's constantly defined by Spock as a 
character. Not even just in this show, but in terms of her appearances in the original series. Like, she's still, like, her only arc in the original series, and that was how they were written in the 60s, is, like, lusting after Spock. I'm in love with you, Mr. Spock. Hearing this scene and being like, I know her arc is kind of like she's going to have a, have a hang-up for Spock her entire life. And so, like, I'm curious. Basically, I'm just going to kind of curious to see where they go with Chapel's arc because I hope they give her more beyond Spock. And I hope that this storyline with Spock and the relationship does end up more with her being like, oh, I wish I could have changed him or done more and I'm going to lust after him for all of the original series sort of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because I don't mind this beat and I actually think it works very well for Boyman to kind of give her like this, oh, am I going to matter in terms of his, his life? Do, do I really mean that much to him or am I just a side note? You know, that's an actual anxiety I could see you're having sans Boimler and Boimler just touching upon it explicitly. Um, I think that that works. I'm just curious to see where that's going to go in future episodes. But I liked this beat quite a lot. But then we have Boimler going up on the bridge and them trying to track the Orion Spock and not able to do it. And Boimler's like, well, look, maybe you can just not look and I can do it without you looking. And him like going under the deck and him knowing what to do. And I, I love them being like, uh, you know, just this is very weird. And Pike's just like, I'm just, I'm just going with it at this point. Uh, I really did like, and I, I love that Ortiz says, future boy did it. it, was wonderful. And I do also like after this moment that Boimler tries to convince Pike to find a peaceful resolution. You know, like it not only could, it, it not only is like something that, you know, he feels should be the right thing to do and Pike being a diplomat, but also because he doesn't want to lose Tendi and if he affects the past, Tendi could never be born or something like that. Uh, and so uh, it's a, uh, it, it, it was really nice to sort of see Boimler arguing not only for Tendi and his friendship with her, but also for the peaceful solution and reminding Pike that he can find a peaceful solution and not always not always assume the worst case when it comes to a specific species like the Orions, not always assume that. And I like that sort of being a lesson from Boimler to Pike. Um, and eventually the Orions uh, are asked for the grain, which can affect the future, um, and they sort of argue for it uh, to get them back. Um, so yeah, no, I also like the little bit where like Boimler's like, tell Captain Pike, and it's like, I can hear you. It's like, oh, I thought the, I thought the span of the room would stop that. <laughs> I thought it was also really, really fun. Um, but then they finally get the Heronium that they need to change the port, use this portal again. But then, uh, they go down to the planet and Mariner comes back. Uh, and she's just like, this is amazing. Is Uhura here? I love it. Um, I, that was just so wonderful to see Mariner. And Tawny Newsom is just clearly having a ball. Loved that. Uh, we come back and now there's, uh, two time travelers. So Pike's kind of like, oh my God. Uh, and I love Mariner, uh, like just freaking out over hot Spock. Cause I agree. Ethan Peck, very, very hot man. Uh, and so she's just like, oh yeah, Hot Spock agrees with me. Love all of that. Um, and I also like the reference, uh, them referencing the episode Past Tense from Deep Space Nine. It's like, oh, you could have gotten sent back to riots during the San Francisco. And I, and um, uh, Ortegas, uh, I believe, saying, have you noticed that all their references are oddly specific, just to specific Star Trek episodes as we know, uh, I thought, and for Boimler Mariner history, uh, I thought was, uh, it was just a lot of fun. Yeah, they, they basically trying to figure out how to synthesize um, like more Heronium. Uh, Spock's going to try to make some, and Mariner gets to work with Uhura on translations. And I love that Mariner's trying to angle. He's like, oh, I want to work with Uhura, and uh, getting him Boimler in to work with Spock, uh, and and just sort of pushing Boimler as Mariner always does. Uh, I, I think that's great. And then creepy Spock joke smiling was also very fun. And Mariner's like, don't ruin this for me. I want to work with Uhura. Uh, we then uh, I also love the scene where like Boimler's running up to catch the Mariner and you just see Jack Quaid like doing the Boimler run uh, and he does the Boimler scream later on with the explosion which was just fun I, I just they I love how both Mariner and uh, Boimler both Tony Newsom and Jack Quaid uh, captured the animated uh, like uh, physicality of these characters in their real life performances. Like there's later on when a Mariner is sitting with um, Uhura, you know, she's sitting like curled up in a ball and that's kind of like how Mariner sits in the animation and boy, I'm like kind of running like, running like this. Um, like it, it was, it was very clear that the, the, the attention to detail in how their characters are portrayed in animation was something that they, these, the actors really wanted to bring uh, into live action. And so I just, I, I really just, I appreciated that attention to detail. It was so seen and as a Trekkie, I just, I love I love that, that Tawny and Jack are just so nerding out about getting to play these characters in live action. It was it was very much uh, loved, and I, and I know I appreciate it, like the Boimler scream and the Boimler run, um, and the uh, and the bisexual sit, as, as as some people will say for for Mariner. Um, I I thought was a uh, I don't know, I just ugh, I loved it. Their performances were so great. 
you know, I uh, I like that uh, Boim was scared of Una, um, Una Chin Riley, and Una thinks that he, uh, Mariner tells uh, her that, uh, you know, he has a pinup poster, and Una thinks it's like a sexual thing, and I think that it's a, it's a fun little joke that will get paid off nicely towards the end. It's like a one-off random thing, uh, but I think it was very, very fun. But the scene that I really liked here was Mariner and Uhura. Uh, for multiple different reasons. One, like Mariner sort of gushing at Uhura and giving Uhura her due um, from like a Trek fan to to Uhura. Um, because in the show, the original series, and even in the movies with Nichelle Nichols, like Nichelle Nichols was great, um, but Uhura as the character never always got her due in the series other than like, like small moments here and there. So for the series to like have this character of Mariner like give accolades to Uhura and, and talk about how revered she is, um, and how revered she is in real life, both in Shell Nichols and Uhura's place in, in a history for numerous reasons, uh, I think was great. And on top of that, speaking of that, for that uh, discussion to be from Mariner, uh, Tawny Newsom, who is a black woman, saying that to another black woman, I think uh, is, is probably got to be particularly meaningful. Obviously, I'm not black, so I can't want to speak for anybody, but you know, I'm sure it is, it is meaningful to see a, a black woman uh, who Tawny Newsom has spoken about how she's a big Trekkie, you know, getting to say to the character of Uhura what she meant uh, to her. Um, and why she's a fan of her, I think has to probably be be an important moment. Again, I can't speak for anybody. Um, but for me, looking in, I was like, I could see why this could be a very important moment. I'd be curious to listen to, you know, any of you out there who may be black or, or may have a love of Uhura for specific reasons, if that if that means a lot to you. Let me know in the comments because I would, I would love to hear that if, that if that's something that resonated with you. It was just something that I saw that I'm like, oh, that seems like it would be a really cool thing. And it was cool to see. Um, but I also love that Mariner's trying to like push Uhura to like, you know, ease up a little bit. Uh, and, and I love that Mariner knows Starfleet laws because they're the ones that uh, allows her to slack off and like labor breaks, I thought was nice. Speaking of labor codes, you know, I have the, um, the qualifier at the beginning of this video of the WGA strikes and SAG after strikes that are ongoing right now. This episode was written by Bill Wolkoff and also I forget the other writer, so apologies to the other writer who I don't know off the top of my head. But the reason I mentioned Bill Wolkoff, um, is I did an interview with him, uh, recently talking about the WGA strike and what a lot of the, uh, workers, specifically the writers, but also similarly SAG after is asking for similar things. It's slightly different, um, things in terms of why they are striking right now. Um, um, so shout out to that interview I did with him. Please go check it out and, and support the writers and support SAG after I eat currently in their, um, in their strike and against the studios. Um, so just something I wanted to call out considering we're talking about labor codes here. And this episode was written by Bill Wolkoff, who I know I interviewed specifically about those very issues. So it was nice to see a little reference to that in here. We also uh, then have a quick scene with uh, Mariner, Uhura, and Ortegas all having drinks and Mariner giving her like a, an Orion drink, which is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, Uhura learning to take a break and Ortegas it's like, yo, you're, you're a good, bad influence, I thought was great. Um, and, uh, you know, Uhura realizing that it was uh, the symbols, because she's taking a break, were of uh, Nausicaans, the Nausicaan words uh, from the word Damjot. And I'm just, it's the reference there being to the episode uh, Tapestry from uh, The Next Generation, where uh, Picard obviously was playing Damjot with, uh, with some Nausicaans that got stabbed in the heart. So that's clearly the episode being referenced there. Um, and, uh, you know, so uh, Uhura realizing that that's where these are from. Play, Tomjot human. Give you a better chance. Give you a bigger stick, maybe. I don't think we're interested. Then we have Boimler and Spock working in the science station, uh, which is just fun seeing Spock doing sciencey stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, them having a conversation, Boimler being reticent to talk to Spock, and Spock sort of deducing everything about, like, oh, I have no choice but to be on the path that I'm on, but I can tell that it bothered Chapel, and you saying that, like, I have to sort of hold on to the emotionless side of me because that's what history needs. Um, and so I, I found that was an interesting conversation, and I'm curious to see where that'll eventually go. But again, I love it t being touched upon here. Uh, Boimler doing the Boimler scream when things get uh when it start things start to explode um and i also like spock sort of saying i'm 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 curious about chance not just talking about uh the situation they're in with the science stuff but also the situation with time travel and him being open to not just following the same path that he's on and this is interesting to me because this season so far has already shown that it is reeling to rewrite canon using time travel as a justification we saw it in episode three with the uh eugenics wars moving up in history so is this like a small reference to the show being like maybe some small things with spock will be different because of boimler now and that then spock saying i'm open to chance 
uh, being like maybe Spock will be slightly different than the Spock that we see in the original series, and the original series is a slightly different thing. So for all of you canon nerds, like I, for me, like I appreciate canon. I think canon should be used when it's when it can be helpful to tell good stories to tell good stories. But when it's in the way of good stories, then I I think it's fine to you know not throw away canon, but massage canon to what you need it to be to tell the story that I think is the best version of the story to tell. So I'm not a big hound for it, but I understand like this is no shade at people who love it. I only have problem with people who are like you only you can only like Star Trek if it's canon. Blah, 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 blah. But the people who are like like canon, like everything to fit, what I like about this is this is a nice way for all of you to be like, oh, I can make it work in my head canon within the franchise of the series. Um, you know, so I, I think that that's a fun way to to discuss canon. Like I said, the only time I, I have a major issue with canon is when people are like, you can't like it because it doesn't fit my specific rules of what canon has to be. And if you don't like it this way, then you're wrong and you're not liking Star Trek the right way. You're not real fans. Like, that's the kind of people that I, I really have a major problem with. But if you're like, I like canon, I like things to adhere to canon as best I can, that's how I appreciate my Star Trek, I support you even though that's not the, exactly the way that I do, and here's here's a way to make that work for you. Then I love that Boimler goes down to see the warp core, because Boimler always loves, uh, you know, he loves hanging out by the warp core. He's a warp core boy, or man, as he says in this ep uh, this scene, with Pella, and I like having a small scene with Pella. This did remind me, like, it is disappointing to me that Carol Kane seems to be underutilized this season. She's got a little bit, like, last episode and here and there, but she hasn't really gotten a full bunch of attention, and I was like, ah, oh, man, I wish we got some more with her, because she's so great in every scene, and I love her messing with Boimler a little bit here and uh, her saying you know you know you got to pretend to be who you want to be and eventually that'll catch up with you and I, that honestly that resonated a lot with me not just in Boimler's arc but you know you know right now you know, I just to give you a look behind my life. You know, I'm working on a film right now. We're going to hopefully be, you know, asterisk with, you know, everything going on with the strikes, but we're hopefully going to be filming soon. And it's been a learning process for me of being like, am I good at the director? Am I good at doing this? And part of what I've learned in the process is you just, just, you, you kind of pretend, you kind of pretend a little bit to like, it's like, yeah, I'm the person that everyone's looking for. And you kind of like, you know, I don't feel that all the time, but I pretend to be. And every so often there's a moment where you're just like, yeah, I can, I can do this. And you believe it, but it takes time to get there. And so I honestly, just hearing that from Pella was actually, it resonated deeply with me in this moment, which is always when I love Star Trek, when it, when it hits you personally. Um, so I just, I honestly kind of needed to hear that. And so knowing that I'm kind of on a similar arc as Boimler right now, um, I don't know. I love that. I love that so much. This is why I love Star Trek, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm going to cry a little bit. Like I love, I love Star Trek so much, y'all. Stuff like this just makes me happy, and getting to connect with characters that I love, like Boimler and, and Mariner, I don't know. I just love this franchise. It, it fills me with so much joy. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, let's move on. Um, But I just, I, I love Boimler, I love Lower Decks, I love Star Trek. Anywho. Um, Boimler then goes to steal a uh, shuttle. And just, I love the, like, holy Q <laughs> when he's scared by Mariner. It's like, ah, oh, they got, like, a Trelane thing going on, obviously referencing Trelane from the original series. Uh, and so Boimler's trying to try and fix the grain problem because the grain was given away to, you know, the Orions, and so now the colonists have to re, um, reorganize and, and be moved somewhere new. So he's trying to fix that by reaching out to the Orions. Um, and, you know, I love Mariner saying, like, you know, helping him. is like, I never get caught. And then Ortega's immediately catching them was great. Uh, and then they get taken to the captain's quarters. And I love this scene between uh, the captain and Boimler and Mariner because there's just so many jokes. Like the, the fact that Boimler got dressed up as Pike for Halloween is like, oh, it was a process getting the jawline was great. And just the back and forth between um, Tawny and Jack was just perfection this entire episode. Like they're just, they're, 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 their cadence was just perfect Boimler Mariner, even in live action. Um, and, uh, you know, Pike saying, I'm going to confine you to quarters. And, you know, he's saying like, you're telling people that I have a birthday coming and please stop doing that. Um, and... And I like that, you know, Boimler's like, we're trying to, well, maybe you only have a few times left. And Pike obviously knows that he's going to end up in the BP chair, as we know from season one um, and Discovery. And, uh, you know, Pike's sort of revealing, he's like, no, I just kind of wanted a moment to like, you know, I never resolve things with my dad. And, you know, this is the first year I would be older than his. He would, he would be, which reminds me of Star Trek Beyond a little bit. There's a scene in Star Trek Beyond where Chris Pine Pike, or Chris Pine Kirk, I should say, um, says like, oh, I'm, I'm now older than my dad was when he died. Uh, and so Pike seems to be having a similar vibe here um, and saying, I wanted to have a good bottle of whiskey and have that talk with my dad by myself. And, and you know, um, Boimler saying, hey, you know, maybe other people would want to have that day with you. 
and Pike sort of like realizing like, yeah, I only have so much time. Maybe I should should be with the people that I love. I, I thought that was a really great lesson for Pike. Again, this episode doing so many things um, and, and referencing, I think, Boimler and, and Mariner uh, wanting time together because we reveal at the end of the episode um, that Mariner did want to take charge of the mission. There was going to be a bunch of ensigns. And so Mariner took, the, as we learned in the final scene, Mariner took over the, the mission for the portal so she could have more time with her friends, even though she would never admit it, um, which I think is sweet. And I think that ties in the Pike's arc really well. Like Mariner never admits who she cares, but she does. She does very deeply. And um, then there's a reference to Archer's Enterprise. And as soon as I heard that second reference, because I knew and I, I caught the NX-01 being referenced in the opening sequence of the episode when the animated series se sections with lower decks. But as soon as the reference again here, I'm like, oh. <gasps> And I will say, I was hoping we'd actually get to see the NX-01. Like, they did a whole thing, and they had to, like, go steal parts of the NX-01, like, go to a star base or whatever. Sadly, that was not the case. But still, it was enough for me to get it, have it be a major plot beat in the episode. Because what we learn is we uh, have this big, like, meeting where, uh, the, uh, uh, where they reveal that, you know, Mariner and Boimler have visited the Starship Museum, which, by the way, I might be the same Starship Museum we see from Star Trek Picard Season 3, so a nice little Star Trek Picard Season 3 tie-in there. Um, and also I love uh, La'an saying I love the grapplers because they use grapplers instead of uh, uh, tractor beams in Star Trek Enterprise but the fact that they uh, it was uh, that the Archer's Enterprise, the NX-01 Enterprise, the one that's way back there on that shelf there and over here, and also I have maybe a uh, tattooed on my wrist right there. Uh, it's there. I kind of like Star Trek Enterprise. I also have the Cerritos here, if you're if you're wondering. The Cerritos is on, on that arm, along with the Discovery and the Enterprise-E. Um, anywho, I might be a Star Trek fan. Um, and the very fact that that... Um, uh, that that Enterprise, which I, if you again, if you're a fan of me, y'all know that I have Star Trek Enterprise was the Star Trek show I watched growing up as a kid, so I have an affinity for Star Trek Enterprise, even though I know it's the black sheep of the Star Trek family. Um, but I like that they are saying that they need a piece of that in order to help save them, and that there was this piece of the NX-01 on this Enterprise, and they use it from uh, the from the um, from uh, engineering. And I love hearing Uhura and Artegas and everyone freaking out, being like, oh, Travis Mayweather, Mahoshi Sato, uh, and them nerding out like the Lower Deckers. And I will say, I really did appreciate, this is a small thing, but I really did appreciate that the the two uh, characters that are called out from Star Trek Enterprise, Travis Mayweather and Hoshi Sato, that are name-checked, not just Archer or T'Pol or Trip, who are the ones that everyone references, but Travis and, and Hoshi are the two people of color. And I think a lot of uh, people would, I, I think it's very hard to argue otherwise, uh, but that Travis and Hoshi, the two people of color in the main cast on that show, were the two most underserved as well, which is part of why Star Trek Enterprise, as much as I li love it, was a regressive show in some regards, um, because it did sort of sideline these characters in a franchise known for its diversity. So the fact that this show took a moment to just highlight Travis and Hoshi very subtly, um, I thought was a nice sort of nod that, hey, those two characters do get their due in the long arc of history, and at least within the Star Trek universe itself. Um, so I thought that was a nice subtle thing that I thought was a very, a very appreciated. Uh, but also like this calling out like how they have a love for the past as well our characters in strange new worlds have a love for for this um this feeling of nostalgia for the past and aggrandizement of the past and then we get a final moment between mariner and una as they're beaming down to the planet uh and una learns that you know she is literally the poster child for starfleet at aspera per aspera the thing that she said in episode two and this touches upon una's arc about still feeling like should she belong in starfleet and the fact that she gets to learn i know it might affect history but the fact that she gets to learn that she becomes the literal poster girl Prost a woman for, uh, for Starfleet has to mean the world to her, especially after everything she went through in episode two. Um, I think that was such a sweet little touching upon their arc and a great way to end it. Like, again, I just love that this episode, in true Lower Decks fashion, by the way, because Lower Decks does it so well, manages to do so much in such a short amount of time, give arcs to almost every single one of our characters that we touch upon. Like, Mariner gets an arc, uh, Boimler gets an arc, Spock gets an arc, Chapel gets an arc, you know, Una gets an arc, Pike gets an arc, you know, every character, Uhura gets an arc, like, all of them do. There's a couple here and there, like, in Benga and a couple others that don't, but for the most part, all of our characters get a full arc. Um, and I thought that that was just nice and very efficient writing, and Lower Decks is great for that. Um, Strange New Worlds as well, but Lower Decks, I think, even even more so. It just packs so much in 20 minutes uh, for every episode. Uh, I thought it was great. And then they go down to the planet. Oh, and I love the bit where it's like, Spock says, live long and prosper. We saw that from the trailers, but I thought that was adorable seeing it in person. And, and Mary's like, yeah, he said the thing. And they go down to the planet. The Orions are there, and Pike manages to find a peaceful resolution with them by saying, hey, you guys are scientists. And as long as history has said, uh, you know, you all, you all are, are, are scientists. 
scientist in the um, the uh, Orion pirate saying, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say pirate, it's offensive. Uh, the Orion uh, saying, oh, that's all I ever wanted. He wanted to be remembered as something other than a pirate. I thought that was nice. Um, and then they go back to animation. Uh, and again, just seeing our crew get, like our Lower Decks crew get to be together, hug each other, I thought was wonderful. And Ransom saying, you know, the TOS era, those old scientists, they referencing, you know, a joke from earlier episodes of Lower Decks, but the name of this episode and the TOS era, how we call, you know, this Strange New Worlds era, the TOS era um, from the original series, uh, I thought was all very funny. And then Ransom hitting on Uda was, you know, Ransom being Ransom, which was funny. Um, and then we learned the thing I already talked about with Mariner, that she did take the portal uh, job on purpose. And then we end the episode out with getting an animated section of our Strange New Worlds crew, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure the people over at Mouse did that in those sections um, and it was it was a lot of fun just to see the crew have a moment of like Pike's birthday party in animation and them getting like high on whatever and them seeing themselves in 2D was was adorable um, so yeah that's my thoughts on this episode like I said uh, objective critic I cannot be really with this episode um, but this was everything that I wanted this was just so joyous it, it, it was it was fun it was light but it had such great character beats and moments boimler being as much a nerd about star trek as i am and same thing with mariner some great little moments of you know calling out like important sometimes marginalized uh, aspects of star trek history both star trek enterprise itself hoshi mayweather uhura um getting these moments of recognition but also telling a really sweet fun adorable story uh with these characters and also jonathan frakes directed it so tng is in here as well um so i i i just i loved this episode very very much and i can tell that i will already put this episode very high uh on my list of you know favorite star trek episodes of all time um that's for me just because this is my favorite thing so yeah I, I i really love this episode um your mileage may vary uh but for me this is everything i wanted i was the moment i heard that this was an episode that was going to be happening um i was very excited and it de and it delivered so Thank you, Strange New Worlds. Thank you, Lower Decks. Thank you, everyone who worked on this episode because um, it warmed my heart in many ways. Um, that's my thoughts on Those Old Scientists, the episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds and Lower Decks that I've been so looking for, forward to. Uh, if you have not watched Lower Decks before, will you check it out now? Do it. Do it. Uh, let me know down in the comments below. And beyond all of that, I hope you all, my friends, live long and do the thing you also live. <laughs>